for a word of prayer and then we get into today's session. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessings. We thank you for your word. You've given us such deep insights dear Lord, insights that are meant to guide us in these difficult last days of our lives as, as we live on earth and we prepare for a heavenly kingdom. But Lord, you have also given us the power of your Holy Spirit so that we can understand your word, we can be drawn closer to you, and we can really experience the pleasure of Christ working out in our lives. When I ask that you give us a joy, dear Lord, a joy that comes not from false reliance on our own abilities, but from an understanding of what you can do and your ability to guide us through even difficult times as we study your word. Guide us through our study today. May you indeed make what is complex, clear and simple and precise. Is our prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. All right, so thank you all again for coming. Um, we have a lot to cover today. So I want to kind of head straight to the screen um, because we have really a lot to cover. We want to make sure that we can cover the material. If we are not um, complete with everything today, we will continue this particular lesson into next week. All right? Um, and then after that, it will be chapter 12. And then, like I said, we will basically come to an end and we can take a stop. Um, and then we may take a week or two and we begin Revelation. All right? So let's get going. Today we are going to study Daniel chapter 11. And I can start off in the onset by admitting that this is a complex chapter. And we'll talk a little about that when we get into some of the later slides. It is a complex chapter. It is a chapter that really um, tests our metal, wants to make sure that we really understand the scriptures. And I want to suggest that in your private reading, when you study this chapter, um, it will be useful for you to use a lot of the Old Testament and allow scripture to guide scripture. Of course, those of us who are blessed with other writings, like the writings of Bible writers like Ellen White um, and some of the others who have appeared in our Sabbath school lesson. And in particular, there's a very interesting bit of work done by Angel Rodriguez, which is in the Biblical Research Institute in May of 2015, as recent as that, that will really shed a lot of light on the last few verses of chapter 11. And we'll use that when we get into that section in, in a little bit later. All right, so today we are looking at the detailed vision of Daniel chapter 11. Of course, we continue recognizing that this is Bible class 2020 and our overall theme is that God has a plan. And that is always gonna be something that should resonate with us because we need to remember that in the face of what looks like confusion God is still in charge. And I hope that we all remember that today. We'll take our time today. We won't rush through, but basically the approach we'll take today is that we will look at um, just a quick review of the methods of prophetic interpretation. We did that last week, but I think it's important when we are studying a complex chapter like Daniel chapter 11 to just be reminded of the principles because it's really important to appreciate that based on the methodology you adopt for prophetic interpretation, you can arrive at a different conclusion for chapters like Daniel chapter 11. We will spend some time reviewing a historical timeline. I think that is important because a lot of this chapter, this single chapter, covers um, the full extent of the historical timeline from the period of the Persians all the way to the end of the world. So that is a huge timeline, and I thought it's important that we spend some time reviewing that. We will return to a little bit of what we looked at last week in terms of the timing and the context of the vision. Um, and that is just a recapitulation, if you will, of Daniel chapter 10 and some key points. Um, and then we'll want to look at the alignment of chapter 11 to the rest of Daniel. And that is a key thing. Um, a lot of times when we discuss Daniel chapter 11, there is a temptation within the Christian world to interpret this chapter on its own, almost as if it's a, um, some sort of fancy writing by Nostradamus or one of the others. 
But the fact is, it is aligned to the rest of the book of Daniel. And if we just agree to that alone, our interpretation of the chapter is a whole lot easier when we encounter the various um, characters, images, and events in Daniel chapter 11. We'll then get into the chapter itself, and then we'll have a concluding message around God being able to lead us. All right, so let's begin with the methods of prophetic interpretation. Of course, as always, you can um, send your questions through the Q&A if, if you're on the Zoom call. And if you're on YouTube, then you can send your questions on the chat. Um, so far, I haven't seen any questions coming out of the Facebook side of things, but we have people who are following us on Facebook, and we say to God be the glory with respect to that. So again, we return to the, the four methods of biblical interpretation, and we talk about pre-theism, which by now you are very good students, and you have seen this over and over again, and I don't need to go over this in any great detail, but we have basically said that preterism is where the assumption is that everything that we see in the prophetic books of the Bible have already been completed, and therefore there is no um, there is no need to be studying them in any great detail at this point in time. We reject that, of course, and there, we also know that there is a, 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 a converse view that says the opposite, which says, well, everything that you reading the scriptures is going to happen in the future and therefore there should be no real worry about that now because those things are future events and you don't have to worry about that today and, and there are some people who um, subscribe to that view and we also think that that is also not the best view then there are those who believe that some of the symbolism that occurred in the bible um, were not symbolism at all that there was really a, a bear that was lopsided there was really a um, a beast that defied description, there was a leopard at four heads, etc. And that they are all analogous to good versus evil. Just as how we talked about <clears throat> Gulliver in Lilliput or 1984 or Animal Farm by George Orwell, they were all books that talk about different things. Some people argue that, that the writings that follow idealism in terms of its interpretation uh, are really writings that talk about good versus evil and they have no specific value to our time today. Again, we think that that is not um, the right approach to take. Um, and the approach we have landed on, which is again, historically, um, no pun intended, this was the accepted approach to interpreting prophetic writings, which is to suggest that the prophetic interpretation holds, and I keep having to make the change. I did this when we were doing Revelation, so I need to just take out Revelation there. But it's really Daniel and Revelation. And it shows the, the, the prophetic symbols covering from the time of the prophet when they receive the vision all the way to the end of time. All right? And so if we keep that view, then when we look at Daniel chapter 11, if we adopt a historicism approach to its interpretation, then we begin to appreciate that we should think about it as unfolding events from the time of the prophet, which at that time, this is a vision Daniel receives in the third year of Cyrus. So it is the period of the Medo-Persian Empire. Um, and therefore the expectation is that the events are covered, they are covering from that period into the modern day era and the end of time. And that is the approach we would like to hold on to. Um, again, Daniel 11 has been um, particularly um, a victim, if I could use that word, of preterism, where a lot of people have interpreted the, the pre-Roman kings um, out of the Seleucid Empire of Antiochus, Epiphanes, Antiochus 4 and 3, etc., as some of the kings that are being mentioned there. And therefore, they think there is no value in looking at that today. Um, I beg to differ, and we will look at that as we go forward. So that is just a review of our four methods of interpretation, which, which I think by now all of us have grown accustomed to. Having said that, we want to look at a review of the historical timeline, and I think that is extremely important. We go to our map, which we have used before, and which I hope by now you all have grown accustomed to, and we are focusing in the Middle East in particular, 
but we are recognizing the Mediterranean basin, if you will, or the Mediterranean Sea. We are recognizing the Black Sea. Um, we are recognizing the, the, the um, Andean Sea, the Gulf of um, Aden, the Strait of Humus, here around Oman and the United Arab Emirates. And we talk all about that. And we talk about Iraq, which was modern day. Well, ancient times, that was Babylon. And then we talk about Syria, which exists today. Israel is on this other strip of land here um, to the east of the Mediterranean Sea. We have Egypt to the south. We have Libya also to the south. We have um, Saudi Arabia as well on the eastern side here. Um, and then we have the African nations that also populate more to the south of Egypt, etc. So it's important to appreciate that Egypt is in the um, African um, continent, if you will, and that in Europe we are talking Turkey as part of um, kingdoms that are in the east of Europe and north of Egypt, if you will. Syria is also north of Egypt. So I, I just want you to keep that clear in your head. So if we were talking about east versus west, then basically um, places like Rome and Greece would have been east, if you will, for a period of time. I mean, west, sorry, for a period of time. And then east, we'll be talking about Turkey and Syria and the Babylonian Empire that existed here would be more from the east. I want to begin quickly by letting you know that when we studied the earlier chapters of Daniel, we were fundamentally um, discussing the battles between east versus west. So in a large extent, Babylon existed to the east. Um, they had a um, fight coming from the Persians who also came from the east and would have fought them but spread the kingdom a little bit more to the west. And then by the time we got to Alexander and the Greeks, we definitely were seeing kingdoms arising from the, from the west and they were attacking our friends in the east, which were the Medo-Persian Empire. Um, and then subsequently Rome which originated around Italy and within Italy would have expanded themselves as they move east. So fundamentally, the battle has been um, between East and Western empires. And as we cover Daniel chapter seven, eight, and as we cover Daniel chapter nine, which was really an explanation of chapter eight, we are really seeing battles between East and West. And that is clearly, um, identified when we look at the Daniel chapter 8 because we saw the ram and then we saw the goat and we saw the fact that the goat was coming from the east and he was attacking the ram with the two horns and he had a big horn in his head and when that broke it was replaced by four smaller horns right the point I want to make though is that as we get to Daniel chapter 11 however what we will encounter is a shift in the thinking, instead of East and West thinking, we will begin to talk about North and South thinking. And the, the, the view here is that subsequent to Greece and Alexander, when his generals would have um, dissected his kingdom into the four cardinal points, North, South, East, and West, eventually what emerged from all of that before the Romans came into being was a consolidation of the power that occurred north of Jerusalem, if you use Jerusalem as your datum line, if you will, um, and some of them that occurred south of Jerusalem. And in the powerful nation that was south of Jerusalem would have been Egypt, and the powerful nation that would have been north of Jerusalem would have been Syria, and to a lesser extent, Turkey, which was then um, Constantinople, um, as its center of the Roman Eastern Empire. So I hope we get that. I'm saying to you that in the earlier chapters of Daniel, as we covered Daniel 2, Daniel 5, when we had um, Belshazzar being destroyed by the Persians, and then when we got to chapters um, 7, when we talked about the, the rise of, of Alexander, we have been really talking about an East versus West conflict and how God's people feared, which is fundamentally why we have these prophecies. Eh? Because these prophecies are telling us how God's people feared. 
um, how, how they survived, how they were protected as battles grew between East and West. However, when we get to Daniel chapter 11, there is a shift, if you will, in the presentation. And Daniel chapter 11 emphasizes, if you will, the battles between North and South. And I want to suggest to you that those battles were at their peak during the time of the Greek generals after Alexander. And then they continued a little bit into Rome. Rome, of course, would have covered as far as Portugal, we even said as far as the United Kingdom. Rome would have covered this whole section of land. But predominantly, if you think about it, Rome existed as a northern kingdom relative to Jerusalem. And Egypt would have still lived and prospered as a southern kingdom together with Saudi Arabia. The other thing to note, which is something that has caused a, a shift in, in the thinking of some of the biblical interpreters, is that the Muslim um, Islamic countries would have started off, if you will, in the south, Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, um, Egypt to some extent. And they would have gained prominence as they pushed more to the north till eventually they overcame Turkey and other nations within the European empire. So there were constant battles, if you will, in the Crusades and during the period of the Inquisition in the days of the Roman empires in the Middle Ages. There were constant battles between north and south. If, if you grasp that alone, you are well ready to deal with Daniel chapter 11. All right, so there's a, there's a physical, a shifting, if you will, in, in the world powers and the domination that is occurring around that time to the extent that north-south conflicts become the more important things. In our, in our study of um, the Christian church, uh, one of the previous lessons, we had developed a timeline that I thought I just want to quickly review. We had said that um, Rome would have started in around from since early 700 BC, but kind of gained their prominence around 128 BC when Julius Caesar kind of came on the scene before, of course, he was eventually assassinated by Cassius and his boys. And then we would have had the period of Jesus Christ. We'd have had Nero's Rome. We'd have had Rome destroyed, uh, destroying Jerusalem in AD 70. And then we had the early centuries when we talked about the the period of peace, Magna, the Magna um, period of peace, I nearly said Magna Carta, but that was illegal part really. Um, the period of peace and where Rome's um, very, very elaborate, civilized period, um, system of roads and stuff would have allowed the, the, the gospel to spread like wildfire. So that after Stephen was stoned in AD 34, and the, 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 um, the apostles started to push forward with the gospel. It went from strength to strength because Rome was at peace and Rome had such a very good system of roads and archery. Pax Romana. Thank you, Pastor. I forgot the term really. Yeah, the period of peace. So that is, that is indeed the term, Pax Romana. All right, so, so that is what we discussed. And then we went on to say that... Um, Around 300, there was a period of persecution as a Roman emperor. This is imperial Rome. I'll talk about that a little bit later because Rome is, is at the heights of its imperialism. It is really um, grabbing nations and turning people to their side, etc. And then we had Constantine who was converted to Christianity and who pushed Christianity and created a, a, a strong union between church and state. But then we had a decline of the Romans around 476, the barbarian tribes. And some things that we have glossed over, which we'll pick up when we get to chapter 11 in detail, is that um, while the, the Western Roman Empire would have experienced a demise, and he would have found that Justinian would have granted the Bishop of Rome, which was a pope at the time, um, civil leadership and armies and stuff. Note as well, that the, the Islamic nations were also in their ascendancy at this point in time, and that they were creating a period of discomfort for the Roman Empire 
and there was significant amount of um, battles and there was a significant amount of fights and, 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 and troubles between East and West that occurred during that period, all right? Um, and then we talked about the French Revolution where the French eventually created a whole period of, of what we like to call secularism because the French introduced atheism as an approach. They said there is no need for God. They talk about the Enlightenment period. They talk about the French Republic. There was no monarchy and nobody vested with any power to run anything. And a large extent, Europe today is still very much a secular society um, where they're, they, they're very, they frown upon any reference to God and any, any sense of feeling as if you were God appointed. When I run this class last time, I always give the, uh, the example of after 9-11, um, Time Magazine ran a very interesting article where when George Bush went to give his State of the Union address after 9-11, and he, he um, identified what he called the axis of evil, which was at that time Iran, Iraq, and North Korea. And he made the case for invading Iraq. He then talked about the fact, because George Bush is a born-again Christian, and he then talked about the fact that he, he, he feels as he was appointed by God to carry out this work, and that God would be on the side of America. And Time Magazine ran an article that suggested that the European allies of America were very, very uncomfortable with a leader of the free world um, believing that God had appointed him. For them, it felt a lot like the old monarchies and the old popes who would believe that they were God-appointed leaders and therefore they were infallible. And, and the, the, the article was a very interesting one because it went on to say that the fear the Europeans had is that if you are doing wrong, you would continue to do the wrong thing because you think God has appointed you. So that is just an example, if you will, of the fact that coming out of the French Revolution in the 1800s and the, the late 1700s is that what emerged in Europe and, and people talk about the fact you could go to Europe today and churches are like museums because there's very little, um, there's very little following, if you will, of church worship and stuff because the Europeans are very secular in their output and, and they, they, they smile at it. I had some European friends who would visit Trinidad regularly when I worked at another company. And, and sometimes they would say to me, Fitzroy, we want to come with you on a weekend to see what you do at that church you go to because we are fascinated by the fact that you go to church every weekend. For them, that was a strange thing. All right, so, so that is classical secularism. And there's a reason I'm emphasizing that, because we'll come back to that as we go forward in a little bit. You talk about the fact that the church would have persecuted um, God's church during that period. And so people had to live in the rocks and the mountains and hide in the shadows and the dungeons, etc. But praise God, God preserved his church and his word during that difficult period, all right? <clears throat> and then around that same time, we had the American Revolution, which will feature prominently when we get to Revelation. And we had the birth of America and its independence in 1776, um, which was just before the period of the French general bringing an end to the, the rule of the Roman church. That is important. So again, I remind you, we talked about East versus West. We talk about North versus South. And we basically said that that is a historical review and timeline. Any questions on this before we go forward? Because we want to go now. This is just um, preparation, if you will, for us to get into the meat of the matter. So we want to get in now, if you will, to the timing and context of the vision. So we talked a little bit about this last week. We said that <clears throat> Daniel is receiving this vision in the third year of Cyrus. And Cyrus is the king of Persia who God himself has appointed. Know that, that God appointed Cyrus um, to carry out the work required to return the Israelites back to their land 
and he would have given the first decree for them to go back. And then there was a huge um, opening, if you will, where in the, in the verses we are told that the forces of evil attempted to, to disrupt the work of Cyrus and his desire to free God's people. And that was a very clear and lucid um, picture, if you will, of how the forces of darkness are, are interfering within the affairs of men and how God is attempting to stop that because we are the angel Gabriel fighting with the prince of Persia for 21 days, if you will. And then we found that the fighting was eventually stopped when Michael, the archangel, who we later last week, clearly identify Michael to be Jesus Christ himself when he showed up and brought an end to the fight. So Daniel is 90 years old. He is, of course, aware that some of his people have gone back to Jerusalem and have started to rebuild the temple based on Cyrus's decree. Daniel himself would like to go back, I suppose, but given his frailty, he is still living in Babylon. But he is also aware that there's been problems when um, the people have gone back and the Samaritans have been creating obstruction for the Jews as this work is going on. So Daniel, when that happens, when Daniel experiences drama and problems in his life, he prays. I could say that to all of us today, right? That when you have drama and problems and uncertainties in your life, it is best that we pray and know that prayer is a much better avenue for success than wringing your hands and crying as you people say kokomina with your friends it is much better to pray when daniel prays however things happen in chapter 2 when he was confronted with a dead decree by nebuchadnezzar when daniel prayed god reveals nebuchadnezzar's dream remember this was a dream that was given to nebuchadnezzar and God revealed it to Daniel. In chapter 6, when Daniel was being thrown into a lion's den, he prayed and God tamed the lion's mouth. In chapter 9, when he thought that it was time to go back home, the 70 years was approaching, God sent Gabriel to explain the vision. Note the progression that is going on here. If we were to accept that the Holy Spirit or God through the Holy Spirit is who influences us, and speaks us through our consciences, we can assume that God gave Daniel a vision in chapter 2, which is really a dream. By chapter 6, he gets a vision, yes, but now an angel actually appears and keeps him company as he tames the lion's mouth. In chapter 9, Gabriel has been sent, who is the head of angels. Gabriel, who is a created being, but the head of the created beings, he comes and he keeps Daniel at comfort. And then ultimately in chapter 10, when Daniel prays, we have progressed to the point where God so loves his servant that he himself come, comes. Jesus himself comes to Daniel and provides comfort to him. And I am I'm really heartened by this, brethren, because it tells me that in my periods of despair, when you think that no church member comes to visit you, God is there. And he is always willing to come forward. So Jesus appears in a vision, and we are told very clearly that the man that Daniel saw is akin to the man that John saw in Revelation. And this is a context of the vision. Now let me make the point very clear to you that as we move into Daniel chapter 11, it is no longer about the vision of Jesus appearing. Jesus appears to give Daniel comfort and Gabriel is the narrator. Let's be clear about that. So Gabriel is the one who's explaining the vision that Daniel sees. Um, Jesus came at the beginning to give him some comfort, but then he sees all these things about kings and fights, etc. And Gabriel is the one who will now give him the explanation going forward. Any questions so far? We have covered the top row of our summary pages. Any questions? Everybody okay? We ready to dive into the deep? Okay, so let's go. We do another quick review. 
I kind of like to do reviews and I want to make sure that through repetition, we all are in the same page with how we are going forward with this. So, so in, in Daniel so far, we are encountering different versions of Jesus Christ. So in Daniel chapter 2, Christ is our king. He is a stone cut out of nowhere whose kingdom hits the image at his feet and then fills the whole earth and lasts forever. In Daniel 7, while we have all these things taking place about beasts and images and, and fights and God's people being persecuted, we got a peep into heaven and we saw that just before the end of time, Christ will be our judge. He will also be our advocate. And then in Daniel chapters 8 and 9, he's also presented as our high priest. I serve a God who is able to take on different forms and functions to assure of my salvation. I think that is important. What we then, if I were to do another summary, if you will, is that we knew that there's a comparison, if you will, between the three visions. In Daniel chapter 2, we had a head of gold in a man vision that is equal to the lion. But there is no Babylon mentioned in Daniel chapter 8 because that prophecy begins with Medo Persia. And then the arms and breasts of chest of silver is equal to the lopsided lion who has three um, bones in its mouth, which represented Lydia, Babylonia, and Egypt, which were the three nations that the Persians conquered in order to become the predominant force in the East. And then we have the ram, which was given in Daniel chapter 8, which is also equivalent to the Medo-Persian Empire. So different symbols, but the same sequence in time is being covered here. And then we had Greece represented by the belly of brass. In Daniel chapter 7, they are shown as a leopard with four heads and wings, saying they rose fast, but they then were dominated by these four heads. And then in Daniel chapter 8, we had a he-goat. Note he is moving with color. That was the verse that the, the word that was used, meaning he was moving with speed and, and great um, intensity towards the media Persian Empire. So notwithstanding this direction seems to be saying it's going west we know in reality the the the, the greek empire went east and captured the media persian empire and then we had rome um the advance of rome rome in two forms um what a lot of writers like to call pagan rome i prefer to call imperial or civil rome because i like to emphasize the fact that rome was practicing expanding of their kingdom at a vast rate by taking on nations and then practicing syncretism. Um, and then we had the image that couldn't be um, identified in Daniel chapter 7, but eventually it was replaced by a little horn, which was representing the religious um, part of Rome. No mention of that in chapter 2. But in chapter 8, we just used the little horn to represent both the pagan um, or the imperial part of Rome, the civil part of Rome, and then the religious political aspect of Rome, which of course most of the writers refer to as papal Rome, because the head of the church would have been the Pope, and the Pope would have been the one who had been custodial upon with civil authority to run the city in addition to his church. All right, what is missing is the intervening period here, um, but in Daniel chapter 2, we are told that in those days, um, of these kings, when is the feet of iron and clay, we have this stone that comes out of nowhere, right? Um, so that's just another view, if you will. Um, and then I want you to realize, let's go back, that Daniel was given three visions between the first year of Belshazzar and the third year of Cyrus. In the book of Daniel, Daniel receives three visions. Now, I want you to think about that, eh? Because I know some of you will tell me it's four visions. And you will tell me that Daniel chapter 2 is a vision. And I will agree with you, it's a vision. But what was a vision that was given to Nebuchadnezzar that Daniel interpreted. When we get to Daniel chapter um, seven, we encounter now 
where Daniel himself receives the visions. And so those are the three. The first one comes in Daniel chapter 7, where he says in the first year of Belshazzar, he had a dream and the visions upon his head. Then in chapter 8, we are told that in the third year of the reign of Belshazzar, he had another vision. This is our visions that are outlined in world history. And we are now encountering the one we're reviewing today, which is in the third year of Cyrus, king of Persia. So three times God brought visions to Daniel. And you will ask me about chapter 9. Well, chapter 9 was an explanation when Gabriel came back to, Gabriel, to, God, to Daniel in chapter 9. He was explaining the Mara. Remember that? The, the vision that was part of the larger vision in chapter 8. All right? So it was still part of the same vision. So there are three distinct visions given to Daniel. So, so that is important because when we start to interpret chapter 11, it is important that we contextualize it in this parallel of visions. In other words, uh, and this is what Elias um, de Souza, who wrote one of the um, supporting books for our first quarter lessons, Sabbath school lessons, he said that the major outlines of Daniel parallel one another and span history from the prophet's time to the establishment of God's kingdom. This is historism in its purest sense, from the time of the prophet to the kingdom, right? So it is normal to expect that Daniel 11 should be in parallel in its interpretation to Daniel chapter 8. And certainly, he is making a point which I fully agree with, that Daniel 11 most likely recapitulates Daniel 8 and 9, expanding on certain aspects of the previous vision. So I want you to just keep that point in your mind because as we deal with all these confusing stuff, it's important to note that if you had followed the sequence of visions in Daniel chapters 7 and 8 and the way the animals were presented, and then if you went back to chapter 2 in the vision that was given to Nebuchadnezzar, one would likely expect, so let's talk about that. If these are the three visions we know so far, excluding chapter 11, these two would have been given to Daniel, and Daniel 2 would have represented a vision given to Nebuchadnezzar. So the first one is a king's vision, and he had a sequence that said Babylon, Medo, well, I had media here, so that we know is not incorrect. That is incorrect. It should be Medo. And, and one of our class attendees reminded me of that a few weeks ago, so I take that fully on board. So this should be Medo Persia, Greece, Rome, and then a supernatural destruction at the end. In Daniel 7, Daniel receives his first vision, but the sequence is virtually the same as we saw in Daniel chapter 2. And then when we get to Daniel chapter 8, the sequence is also the same, except that, so this is now in the third year of Belshazzar, but we are leaving out Babylon because Babylon is on its decline. It's about to be replaced by the Medo-Persians. But importantly, more importantly, the fact is that the 2300 days prophecy is, is contained in this chapter, is given in this chapter, and the starting point for that prophecy is 457 BC, which is in the period of the Medo-Persian Empire. So that is given to us here, and we expect the same sequence. So, so one could reasonably expect, God is not a God of confusion. So one could reasonably expect that when, God, when Daniel receives his third vision in Daniel chapter 11, it should follow this sequence either in whole or in part. And so that is what we need to discover if in truth and in fact that is happening. Um, each vision was more detailed than the previous one. I think all of us can appreciate that, right? So we got this vision in Daniel 2. In this one, we saw the two-phase room. We saw a judgment scene inside of here. We saw that the Medo Persian Empire also captured three nations before. When we got to Daniel chapter 8, we talk a little bit more about the work of the 
um, little horn and roam and how it will do such great things against God's people, etc. And then we were given the 2300 days prophecy, which was a key prophecy that talked about the, the, that prophesied the, the coming of the Messiah, Jesus Christ and his death and the Jews period of, of special treatment coming to an end in AD 34 and God continued to carry this judgment. But more importantly, it introduced into our thinking, which was something that was already introduced in Daniel chapter 7. It expanded on that in Daniel chapter 8 about the concept of a pre-advent judgment, which is a judgment that occurs before our sheep and goat judgment that occurs when Christ comes. So there is in truth and in fact a progression where each vision is more detailed than the previous one, right? They explain the experience of God's people in each period of history. I want us to appreciate that. These are not just visions for vision sake so God can boast and say, look, look, I am a God who can predict the future. God has given these visions because he wants to remind Daniel that the Babylonian captivity that they are in now will not last forever. And as they contemplated Medo Persia's ascent, they would have remembered the prophecies in Isaiah and Jeremiah and Chronicles that talked about the fact that Cyrus will become as a liberator and that he will allow them to rebuild the temple. So God was basically given guidance as to what will happen. And certainly when the details of Rome are revealed in Daniel 7 and 8, God is again providing sustenance and guidance to his people who would go through a period of intense persecution during the 12, 60 years from 538 AD to 1798 AD. And I could well imagine those Christians who were hidden in the rocks and the mountains, they were well aware that one day this period will come to an end and Christ will put in his appearance. So the, the point to make here is one, that each vision was more detailed than the other, and two, that the visions were really describing periods about how God preserves his people throughout history. So, so I, I am coming to a conclusion therefore, based on what we have studied, that for us to understand Daniel 11, it would be good if we can study that in a context of the other visions and know that they are related to each other, right? So, so um, that is our first big clue to understanding Daniel chapter 11. And I will, I will just give you the final version of that without going through too much detail. And we'll come to it as we go along. I know some of you would have tried to read Daniel chapter 11. And by about the middle of the chapter, you got so confused, you put it down. I want to encourage you, after we reviewed what we have done today, to read it again. I know it's confusing. It's like a little book of riddles. But now we have in today, hopefully, the key to the riddles. So in chapter, in verse 2 of Daniel chapter 11, they are talking about the media Persian Empire, Medo Persian Empire, sorry. And, and again, that is consistent with Daniel chapter 7, verse 5, and Daniel chapter 8, verses 3 and 4. In Daniel chapter 11, verse 3, they are again discussing the Greek empire headed by Alexander and the fact that the empire was divided thereafter. And again, that was covered in Daniel chapter 7, verse 6, and chapter 8, 5 to 7, and 8, 8, right? In Daniel chapter 11, these are the verses that covers this. I want you to note this. Note how much verses are devoted to Greece is divided. So if you accept this separation based on the historicist biblical scholars who have come before us, because we are not trying to pretend that we know it all here. We have read the books and just reviewed the data. So while, while in Daniel, in the earlier visions, one verse was used to talk about Greece. And then we had um, three, four verses to talk about Greece here in Daniel chapter 8. When we get to Daniel chapter 11, one verse talks about Alexander, but about 11 verses are devoted to talk about this divided section in Greece. 
And that, brethren, is a key to understand. I was going to say it later, I can say it now. There's a, there's, a, there's a temptation and an erroneous view we have that the succession of these kingdoms occurred um, on, on schedule and occurred very easily. And just as how we have elections and you went from UNC to PNM and then PNM to UNC in a year or so, and in Jamaica, they just had an election. They went from JLP to JLP again, whatever. Just as how we think you could point to what year that happened today and you can tell when different um, governments took over. Do not be fooled into thinking that the, the movement between Medo-Persia to Greece to Imperial Rome were very nice, clear divisions in time. It's not as if the Medo-Persian Empire said, Okay, my time is up. Greece, your turn now. And we could clear, no, no, no. These periods of transition are periods of great wars and conflicts. They are periods of prolonged battles in some cases, very intense fights and battles. And to some extent, we have been spared that in giving these broad overviews in chapters 2, chapter 7, and chapter 8. But when we get to chapter 11, God stops, and I like that about God, and he gives us a little bit more detail. It's grudgy detail. It's detail that you have to kind of labor through. But it's detail that tells you that in the midst of these battles and transitions and these devious fights that are taking place, God is still in control. And I want you to remember that in your personal lives, brethren, because sometimes... We experience periods of prolongs and prolonged drama in our lives that seem it will never end. Maybe it is some, some, some emotional battle, some economic situation, some social, socio-psychiatric um, situation we're experiencing. And look, I give it will never end, maybe some illness. But I want you to know that the same God who has been through these transitions is the same God we are serving today. Is that okay? Again, look how much chapters, verses are devoted to talking about imperial room and how much verses are devoted to talking about religious political room. And then I want to give you a heads up. You see this section here? Daniel 11, 40 to 45. This is big stuff. When I approach this, I approach this with prayer. Because as we talk about this, we're going to be talking about things that have not yet happened. And we have to be really careful how we interpret it. This has been a subject of a lot of discussion among biblical writers and interpreters up to today. So I quoted an article that was written as recent as 2015 in the Biblical Research Institute, where this area is explained. I'm going to try to cover that today. I'm hoping we can. If not, we'll do it next week. All right? And then we come to the second coming of Jesus Christ, which is also discussed. Daniel chapter 12, verse 1 to 3, is a part of this very vision that we are viewing in chapter 11, but we'll discuss that when we get to the second side. I hope this sinks in, because I really want you to understand that the succession of kingdoms that is occurring here, um, it's occurring in a schedule and a time frame, yes, but it's not smooth. It is, not, it is not seamless. It is fraught with wars and battles. Consider each of these white lines a period of battle and war. And Daniel 11 gives us a very um, clear insight into the Natian battles that are taking place. So if you use this legend, when you return to look at Daniel chapter 11, after we've been through most of the slides today, Hopefully, you will see as this developing pattern. And, and based on this pattern, you can, you can find it easier, based on our historical references, of course, and what the history says, to interpret the various sections of the chapter going forward. Are you okay with that? All right, any questions? So we've covered review and alignment. And now we go to overview. And the third vision explained. Now we're getting into the actual chapter itself. And given what we just discussed, 
we will hit a whole new summary now as we go through them bit by bit. I will begin with an overview of the chapter. Um, we'll talk about Persia and what it said about Persia. We'll talk about Greece and what it said about Greece. I want to introduce the kings of the north and south because that is what this chapter pivots into a conversation. Instead of about talking about East and Western conflict, this chapter introduces a, a conflict between the kings of the north and the kings of the south, which is a direct consequence of how the Greek empire emerged after Alexander. So that is important. We'll talk about imperial Rome, and then we'll talk about religious political Rome. Again, I continue to hold on to my, um, my, my descriptions. I know everybody is familiar with pagan and papal Rome. I think we need to expand our thinking beyond that. It wasn't just pagan, it was imperial. And we talk about why I use that word imperial. And then this is religious political because they continue with their religion. And then we'll talk about the time, the end time, which is what Daniel 11, 40 to 45. I want you to keep that circle in your head. Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is a most critical bit of um, scripture. Very exciting to study it, but you cannot study it without having a good grasp of some of the principles that we've discussed before. And I can tell you now, you must study it in the context of what we know of Revelation. So that is a trap for us because we haven't gotten, we haven't moved the Revelation as yet, but we still need to understand what 11, 40 to 45 says. And so we'll have to come to that as we go forward. So let's say the overview. The overview, the first thing is that I want to remind you that it was Gabriel who had come to make Daniel understand what will befall his people in the latter days, for yet the vision is for many days. I, this, this section that we have underlined, I want that to sink in. Because sometimes, just like Revelation, you know, people for years carried around this view that Revelation is a closed book and nobody could understand it. And I heard that as a young man growing up within the church, people would sometimes say, nobody could understand Revelation. It's a closed book. I mean, wait for the big preachers who would come from outside with the um, projector screens and the um, slide projector screens and the big tents. And then we gas a little bit. If you got a call portier who was walking around with Daniel Revelation by Uriah Smith, you were happy because you could read that. But there was no internet. There was no proliferation of information like this today. And so we had these vague understanding of the passages. And not only did we think that Revelation was closed, some people also thought that Daniel 11 was not a chapter you could understand. How many times you've been in your church and you've had a sermon preached on Daniel chapter 11? Because even as preachers, we struggle to understand the book. So hopefully as we go through the session today and maybe next week, we'll have a better understanding of chapter 11. The point I want to make, however, is that Gabriel was sent to explain because God wanted Daniel to understand. And that is important. The other point to note is that a lot of what is in the chapter, he says, was for yet the vision is for many days. In other words, it was meant to be many years in the future. This same, this same sentence construction is used when we look at Daniel chapter 8, verse 17, when they talked about the 2300 days prophecy, and he told him the vision is for the time of the end. Right? So it's important to realize that the fulfillment of some aspects of Daniel chapter 11 will occur towards the time of the end. And we'll come back to that in a little bit when we go to the chapters. So, just some quick summaries here. Daniel 11 is probably the longest and most detailed prophecy in the Bible. It mentioned wars, persecution, suffering in connection with alliances and conflicts, which is how the, the ancient world would have run their nations. There was a lot of alliances and conflicts. It talks about national politics, world government, and power plays involving nations and ideological fractions. And it seems overwhelming, right? So all of this can easily cause believers to retreat or just as dangerously to embrace worldly methods to advance God's work. Sometimes we, we look at this and we say, 
I can understand this. I'm not going to preach God's word. I'm going to preach what I think, right? But it's important to stay with God's word. Continuing on this very um, theme around complexity, it says a complex chapter shows that the powers of the world by themselves can neither thwart nor advance God's work. And that's an important point. Because while all this fighting is taking place, Israel is being rebuilt, God is ensuring that his nation goes forward, Christ comes and he dies for us, the gospel is spread in the Dark Ages period, and then post the Dark Ages period and Protestantism, the gospel is spread to the point where today we could be in Bible classes virtually and talk about God's work, right? So God's work continues. The truth is of great practical, this truth, sorry, is of great practical significance. In times of personal, I just want this, 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 this paragraph to sink in, please, because it has personal application. In times of personal uncertainty, whether we face financial, health, or another crisis, we can cling firmly to God, knowing that everything is subject to his sovereignty. Even when evil is perpetrated against us, the prince of Persia was coming to stop Cyrus um, from agreeing to allow the Jews to continue to build their temple. Evil perpetrated against us. God can turn it into seemingly good. Amen? And that's extremely important. So notwithstanding the complexity of Daniel, however, Jesus also made a reference to Daniel when he talked about the um, desolating sacrilege in Matthew 24, 15, a very important um, chapter. And so it's important to appreciate that Jesus wants us to understand the vision. So if, if we go back to our slide, I'm suggesting to you that these divisions that we encountered, of course, they are aligned to what we saw in the previous chapters of Daniel. And that alignment is what helps us understand. And they lead us into reviewing this book this chapter along these lines. We will talk about Persia, and we, for that we'll focus on Daniel 11, 1 to 2. We'll talk about Greece, and for that we'll focus on Daniel 11, 3 to 4. Do not get turned off by Ptolemies and Seleucids, but that is simply north and south. Um, I will talk about kings of the north and kings of the south. This is actually king of the south and king of the north, but we'll talk about it in the context of these names, Ptolemies and Seleucids. And that will be from Daniel um, 11, 5 to 14. We'll talk a little bit about imperial Rome. We'll talk about religious and civil Rome. And then our headline verses, um, which I'm raising the anticipation around, is the end time. Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Everybody okay so far? You all okay? All right. So let's keep going. We want to get to Persia. This one is simple, so we won't spend a long time on this because by now you are um, experts on the Medo-Persian Empire, right? So Persia, of course, is covered in Daniel um, 11, 1 to 2. We talked about it before um, in this table. And now we want to talk about how it appears. He says, and now in verse 11 to, now I will tell you the truth. Behold, three more kings will arise in Persia and the fourth shall be far richer than them all. By his strength, through his riches, he will stir up against the remnant of Greece. So in Daniel 11, if I go back to this, Daniel 11 begins to point to the fact that the Medo-Persia empire will give way to the Greek empire because there will be battles between Medo-Persia and Greece. Now he mentions four kings, and I want to tell you historically, there were more than four kings in Medo-Persia, but these four are significant because of their progression to Artaxerxes, or Ahasuerus as you would have called him, who was their main king and who was involved in the command to restore and build Jerusalem, and would have also been the, um, the, the husband of Queen Esther. So, so Gabriel showed Daniel how God was in control of the historical period, and then he explained what would happen next. So the three Persian kings, after Cyrus, who was the first of, were Cambys, Sermides, Sermides, and Darius, right? 
And then he was, they were followed by a fourth king who was Xerxes. So, so Darius had tried to invade, invade Greece, but he was defeated. And then Xerxes, he got to Athens, where he was also defeated. Again, when you look at this, and I could tell you, and you could decide if you're going to look at it or not. The movie 300 with Gerard Butler is a good, um, a good depiction, if you will, of, of the fight between the early Greeks, which at that time um, were fighting the, the empire of the Persians, where they were a massive empire. All right? So, so that is basically that is it for Persia. We, look how easily we've covered that. All this is telling us is that Persia will have three or four kings after Cyrus. He will highlight the fact that after Xerxes is the, is the one he wants to talk about. They will try to fight um, Greece, and that we know historically is correct. So we have just um, gotten past Daniel 11, 1 and 2. So we can take a, a, big, um, a big clap over the fact that we've done that, right? So we come to Greece. Now we know what to expect in Greece. In Greece, we should expect um, some discussion around Alexander, and then some discussion around his four generals, because that is what is consistent with the previous visions. So we come to Greece, and in truth and in fact, that is what we want to talk about. So in Greece then, he says in verse 3, then a mighty king shall arise, and I won't continue to quote all the verses, eh, but for now we do it, right? Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule at great dominion and do according to his will. Clearly that is Alexander. Right? Because Alexander was the one who was able to, um, to join the, what is called the Hellenic states um, and confront Xerxes. So after um, some of the others, the Spartans would have lost the battle against the Persians. Eventually, Greek would unite under Alexander and they would get to the point where they would defeat Persia um, about 150 years after that. Right, So when the Greeks would have eventually defeated Persia, and Alexander became um, the great, the, the one who conquered. Remember, he died very early in his tenure at age 32. And as a result of his death, um, there, was, there was no way that his empire could continue because there was a lot of fighting because of his half-brother who was not well, and he had an infant son who had, um, was weak, etc. His empire was divided into four large kingdoms, right? So this is where that, that Ptolemy and Seleucid comes from, right? So look at this empire. Try to see this picture here. I'll come back to it a little bit later. But this is our Mediterranean Sea. This is likely to be Egypt, which is north of Africa. This is Turkey, if you will. And this is Greece, Macedonia. All right, so here we are talking about Iran, Iraq, which was been the old Persian area and the old Babylonian area. So when Alexander died, what his generals did was they said, Ptolemy, you will take the south, including Egypt. So that became his empire. Know that he also had Jerusalem and Judea, which was part of the southern empire. And he comes into the, the Gulf here, right? So he is in the south. Seleucid, or Seleucus at the time, he would have taken more to the east empire, and he would have had Syria, which was just above north of Jerusalem, and parts of Turkey. Lysimachus would have taken Turkey, and Cassander would have gone back to the motherland, if you will, and taken Macedonia, and Greece and Athens, etc. So post Alexander, Greece was run, was run and operated as a four-part nation. That is not um, something strange. Trinidad and Tobago is made up of two um, countries, but we are referred to as one, two islands, sorry, and we refer to as one nation. America, the United States of America, is made up of many different states, all of them with their governors, but federally they are known as the United States of America. But you know now, certainly as we have looked upon the news 
with how they are dealing with COVID, etc. You know now that individual states wield a lot of power of their own. So in a similar way, even though Greece would have been federally known as a nation, individually, these, these generals control sections. And I go over it again. Ptolemy is controlling the south. Cassander is controlling the west. Lysimachus is controlling the north. And Seleucus is controlling the east. I can tell you now, so that you don't have to figure it out, that over time, while the Greek nation continued to be strong, because Alexander only was around for about four years, but the Greek nation continued for many years to the point that some of us, we still study Greek in school today, right? Jason and the, and the gods and all that kind of thing. So the fact is Greek became a powerful nation long after Alexander. I can tell you that what eventually happened was that Greek became more of a north-south nation than the four cardinal points. In other words, as Lysimachus and his armies became, and Cassander became weaker after they died, etc., the Seleucids, these are now the descendants of Seleucus, they kind of control most of the area to the north, and Ptolemy and his descendants control most of the area to the south. Everybody okay with that? <clears throat> so it is reasonable that when you talk about south, the main country was Egypt. When you talk about north, the main country would have been Syria and to a lesser extent Turkey. Just keep that in your mind, take a note of it, and we'll come back to it as we go forward in repetition as we like to do in this class. So we're repeating again what we just said. Alexander died at age 32 in 323 BC. Um, he was survived by a half-brother who was brain damaged and an infant son who was born after he died. So clearly the son can take over. So the, the generals took over. We had Cassander to the west, which we just looked at, by Symmachus to the north, Seleucus to the east, and Ptolemy to the south. And I'm telling you, I'm giving you that, that, that um, giveaway because I want you to keep it in your mind that over time, um, Cassander's and Lysimachus kingdoms, if you will, or nations or, or provinces, they, they, they became weak and became assimilated within Seleucus's domain. So after a while, Seleucus was more the king of the north and his descendants were more the king of the north as opposed to the east, and it became more a situation of north versus south, or north and south as part of the kingdom. But you alright with that? So we've covered Greece. So my that little that little um, TTT I gave you about north and south introduces us to our next area within our summary, which is the kings of the north and the south. So you begin to appreciate now that Daniel 5 to 14 is really around um, the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. All right? And as it's interesting, I won't do it today, but there's a very interesting description that takes place in Daniel 11.6 that was very, very specifically identified between the daughters of um, Ptolemy and Seleucid subsequently and talks about some treachery and stuff that takes place. Um, and one of the kings from the north and king from the south and their wives known as Bernice and, um, and, and, and Laodicea, I think was her name. Not Laodicea, but, but yeah, Bernice and another one. I can't remember her name exactly. All right, so, so let's try to align ourselves with this north-south thinking. Is our map of the world? Of course, we were to run a line, an imaginary line through here. This is not equator, no. I'm just running an imaginary line that lines up with where Jerusalem is. We could reasonably say everything north of this is the northern kingdoms, which include Turkey and stuff. And everything south, which includes Egypt, is part of the kingdom of the south. All right? So that is the area that we're discussing. Let's make it a bit bigger. So we're really talking about a line through here that makes, I told you, Turkey and Syria now considered to be part of the northern kingdoms and Israel to some extent, but Israel is really small in the game compared to Egypt, who is the dominant player here, and Libya at her side. 
um, Egypt becomes the real powerhouse of the southern kingdoms. Is that okay? Once you get your bearings right with that, be in readiness to go forward understanding the rest of the chapter. So, so basically, the king of the south would have been, so when, I, when the chapter makes reference to the king of the south, we are thinking about the Ptolemies, going back to this, who lived in Egypt and controlled Libya, Lebanon, Cyprus, and Judea. All right, so understand that this area here is also part of what is considered to be the kingdom of the south, which is the area around the, um, the, the eastern seaboard of the Mediterranean Sea. All right? The king of the north would be fundamentally the Seleucids. Um, their capital is Antioch and Syria. Antioch, of course, is more towards Egypt, which would be the old, uh, more Greece, sorry, which would be the old Cassandra Empire. And they, they range in strength. At one time, they control from India to Greece. So you begin to appreciate how powerful, because Greece is here. And all the way down to India and Pakistan and stuff would have been the kingdoms to the north. Everybody okay with that? This is important. All right, so um, <clears throat> I just want to go back to the map we have used before and tell you that this was how they were originally separated. Ptolemy to the south, um, Seleucus to the east, Ly Lysimachus to the north, and Cassander to the west. But over time, these guys fell away, were not as um, prominent as, as the others, if you will. And eventually, the Sal Seleucus or the Seleucids, they kind of control everything for me. I mean, just said that at one time the empire went from Greece all the way down to India. And Ptolemy controlled Egypt and most of what is around Egypt, including Libya and some of the other nations. Let that sink in, please. This is another view of it. Um, so you had the Seleucids. If you use Palestine as a demarcation, the Seleucids are here. They are to the north, if you will. Um, Palestine is here. <clears throat> And then everything to the south would have been the Ptolemaic, Ptolemaic Empire, all right? So that, why is all of this important? Why is all this geography important? Because what we realize is that there are many battles between the kings of the north and the kings of the south in the closing centuries BC. So, so in, in what would have been maybe around um, three... 100 BC to about 168 or so, there, there's a lot of fighting between the kings of the north and the kings of the south. Note I say kings, because these, um, these kingdoms, people are, are succeeding each other from time to time, whether it's through debt or through overthrow, whether it's through treacherous alliances, etc. So that really, um, and this is just an example, of some of the fights that are being depicted in Daniel chapter 11. So, so one author is suggesting that in Daniel chapter 11 verse 5, we have Ptolemy 1, who is um, king of Egypt. He's fighting Seleucus 1, who is the king of Syria. So this was one of the Syrian wars. Then in Daniel 6 to 9, we have Ptolemy 2, he is also fighting, he is fighting Antiochus, sort of, that is a fight within the north itself. And then they are also fighting each other and the Seleucus and stuff, right? So there's a lot of battles taking place, um, which is referred to as, I notice the time periods here, 274, 260. We really don't study these a lot, but what Daniel chapter 11 is opening up to us is that there were a lot of fights occurring here. And, and I will come to why that is featuring so much in this Bible and in the chapter. And then we had Antiochus, who is, of course, from the north. He is fighting another Ptolemy in the south. Again, verse 10 to 13 is talking about another battle. So there are many battles. Don't beat up your head. If you can't remember it, I don't want you to remember it. All I want you to approach is to know that from 5 to 15, 
we are covering a number of physical battles in the, between the North and the South. And they are known as Syrian wars because the prominent kingdom to the North is Syria and the prominent kingdom to the South is Egypt. Everybody okay with that? So look, verse 14 says, now in these times many shall arise against the king of the South. Also violent men of your people shall exalt themselves in fulfillment of the vision, but they shall fail. So this is again depicting a lot of battles and fights that is taking place, right? The king of the North and the king of the South represent different kings and kingdoms until the end of time. And I'll come back to that one because we know that the end of time is Daniel 1140 to 45. Therefore, the identities varies as the events unfold. Is that okay? So we are not just talking about single empires only. The, the, the empire changes and varies from time to time. All right? Um, yeah, the other point is to note that initially the king of the south is the dynasty of the Ptolemies, Egypt, and the king of the north is the dynasty of the Seleucid, which is Syria. Palestine, the promised land of the Jews, was located between the two kingdoms. So I want you to understand that. Eh? Um, you know, my, my, one of my Caribbean heroes is the late Maurice Bishop. And he was one of those who would argue with the U.S. during the Reagan Empire that there are nobody's backyard. Because the Americans had this thing that you could not have communism existing in their backyard. And those of you old enough to remember the Cuban Missile Crisis would know that that was an example of where the international affairs was that Russia was attempting to put nuclear and cruise missiles in Cuba. And John F. Kennedy lined up the warships and there was nearly war in the Caribbean waters because he was saying nobody comes in our backyard. In the case of Palestine, Palestine is in the backyard of Syria. Palestine had joined Syria. And so you could appreciate that when the kings of the north, Syria, and the kings of the south are fighting Egypt, who is in the middle? Palestine. Who lives in Palestine? The Jews. Who are the Jews? God's people. So the, the, the reason this kind of detail is given in Daniel 11, because some of you are turned off and you say, why should I study all this detail? Well, it's important because it's important to remind you that just as in the Middle Ages, which is what we are accustomed to talking about, people going to dungeons and going to lions and being put to death and burned at the stake. During this period, during the early, the late BC centuries, 300, uh, I told you 168 BC or so when Julius Caesar even came on the scene, um, the kings of the north and the kings of the south are in constant battle and God's people are in the middle of there, and they are changing hands from time to time. One minute they are owned by the kings of the south, next day they are owned by the kings of the north. On top of that, as the battles are occurring, this is not modern day time, so they're not using aeroplanes, they may be using ships, yes, but a lot of times they are traversing through Jerusalem. So there is constant battle between Jerusalem um, and some of these invading nations, to the extent that later on we'll find that Judas Maccabees, I thought I'll drop that name because those of us who grew up in the church long time, when you hear Maccabees, you think it's an evil book you shouldn't study. But now we know that the Maccabees were part of Jewish history. And the Maccabees led revolutions against the, the tribe, would have led revolution of the Jews against some of these more reading um, nations that were passing through Jerusalem. And eventually they form alliances with the Romans. But the Romans first created alliances with Judea and the Maccabees. But then later on, Rome became a powerful nation of her own and controlled everything to the point that by the time Israel moved from being a alliance to a colony of Rome. And that is extremely important. So, so I hope that we begin to appreciate that this is the reason why there's so much detail here, because God's people are in the middle of all these battles and they obviously will think God has forsaken them. But by talking about it from beforehand, God is given the assurance that he is still 
in control. So, so this is the one I just referred to the last point, which is to tell you that Antiochus Epiphanes, who was living in the north at the time, he would have also tried to convert the Israel nation into Greek um, Medio Persia thinking. And the Maccabees would have been a proud um, Jewish leadership group. They, um, they were different family members, etc. They rebelled against us and they led Israel into an allegiance with Rome so that the Romans could help fight off um, this, this king from the north. But eventually, of course, the Romans became um, a dictator themselves, all right, and an imperial power themselves. Everybody okay here? Yeah? I want to pause and just make sure you can cast all of this. All right. So let me just say this. Most students of Daniel view Daniel 11, 5 to 15 as portraying the wars between the Seleucid and the Ptolemaic dynasties. Although disagreements may arise as to which specific ruler or military event is in view in each case. So in other words, there is very little um, confusion in the biblical world that this is in truth and in fact the, the, the um, closing period of the Greek empire that is depicted here in Daniel chapter 11 in great detail. And I find that fascinating that God could give Daniel such detail. Clearly that was not just for Daniel's benefit. It was the benefit of the Christians who would come after. And I dare say, I want to be presumptuous enough to say, it is for our benefit. So that when we go through drama and calamity in our lives, and we like to feel that we are victims, and nobody is helping me, and everything going wrong in my life, think about the Christians who would have gone through this period and experienced death and destruction every day. Think about the Christians who went through the Roman period and realized that we don't have it so hard. And if God could have been with them, then clearly he could be with us today. All right? So just as another summary, Daniel 11 focuses on the kings of the north and the kings of the south because God's people living between the warring parties would be affected by the war and ultimately become the target of the final attack. However, as a prophecy reaches its climax, it becomes evident that God who stands above and behind the unfolding military, political, and religious events will destroy the enemy. 21st century Christian, when you think you have drama, these people had drama, and God saw them true. All right? I think we will take a stop in a little bit, and then we will have to pick up the rest next week. Let me just quickly talk to you about Imperial Rome. So... Daniel 11:14 says, And in those times there shall many stand up against the king of the south. King of the south is Egypt. Everybody okay with that? Also the robbers of thy people shall exalt themselves to establish the vision, but they shall fail. So this is saying the robbers of thy people. Remember this is Gabriel speaking to Daniel. Daniel is a Jew. So the robbers of his people must be somebody who would eventually rob the Jews of their civilization. The people who robbed the Jews of their civilization were the Romans because they became citizens of Rome. They no longer could have a king and they became a colony of Rome. Look at verse um, 16. It says, But he that cometh again he that cometh against him, sorry, shall do according to his own will, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land, which is by his hand shall be consumed. The glorious land is Jerusalem. So that there is a king that emerges from the north who will one day take control of the glorious land. That wasn't any Seleucid king. That wasn't any Antiochus Epiphanes because he only lasts for a few years. The kingdom that took control of the glorious land was the Romans. When Jesus was born, Caesar Augustus ruled the world. At the time he was in, put to death, Tiberius Caesar was the one who was in charge and the one who eventually put him to death. So it's important to appreciate that 
Daniel 11, 16 and 14. And this whole section here, if we go back to 11, 15 to 28, is introducing us to imperial Rome. And I, I use that word imperial deliberately. Imperialism is a, a policy of extending a country's power and influence through colonization, use of military force and other means. So Rome at this stage was really pushing imperialism. And that is what when and Pastor reminded me, Pax Romana, that period of peace. Why it was so important? Because what the Romans did was say to these nations around them, look, if you agree to be part of the Roman kingdom, we will not invade you. We'll allow you to carry out some of your beliefs. We will do expect we expect you to pay allegiance to the emperor and to recognize he's in charge. But you can continue with most of your customs and your traditions, etc. So by doing that, they expanded their kingdom. And, in, and Rome, during this early, the early centuries, up to 476 AD, were really um, an imperial nation more than anything else. That's why I told you I am not a fan of pagan Rome. Because while pagan gives us a certain connotation, imperial kind of tells us that Rome was about expansion. Rome was about um, aggrandizement, hegemony. They were about bringing in people under the banner and the flag of Rome, if I could use that term. And that was their bigger point. And so when, when Constantine, who was an emperor, became a Christian, he leveraged the power of the nation of Rome into the church. And because of that alignment, which is something that the Bible seems to predict will happen again in the future, that alignment of church and state, he was able to advance the cause of Christianity, albeit false Christianity, um, throughout the ages of history. All right? So Rome is, is um, the one who's been referred to as here. Um, and then this reference it as the glorious land is what is important, right? So notice that that, that, that stretch of, of um, description goes from Rome, Daniel 11, 15 to 28. So I won't read all of that now, but I wanted you to appreciate that it covers a lot of things. It talks about a lot of fights that the Romans would have had to go through to become the powerful nation that they were. So that while the Roman is, empire is growing in Europe and, in, and around the Mediterranean basin, notice as well, if, whenever we went back to the maps of Rome, they also included sections of Egypt. So Rome would have fought the king of the south as well, which is also with reference here in these passages, right? So some of the things that Rome did during Jesus' time I mentioned here, it talks about the one who imposes taxes. Well, you remember that when Jesus was born, we were told that Caesar had demanded a, a census and that everybody needed to be taxed and he wanted to know the, the numbers of people everywhere, which was why Mary and Joseph were moving, etc. And then we talk about a vile person, Jesus is crucified during his reign. All that is mentioned in these passages. And it talks about they shall be swept away and the prince of the covenant, which is a reference to Jesus and the fact that Jerusalem is destroyed. The point I'm making here to you is that um, imperial Rome and the things that occurred during the time of imperial Rome is caught up in the, in the riddles that are included in verses 15 to 28. And that continues even to the fact that um, so, so verses 27 to 28 describes the growth of the church since Constantine reign. And it talks about the transition of imperial Rome to a religious political Rome, which will occur in 538 AD. All right? So, as just a brief summary. And really, uh, my point here is to say to you that having understood that the Greek kingdom after Alexander became effectively a kingdom of north and south, and that they fought incessantly for a while and for many years. Eventually, the Roman imperial country or, or city or nation would find itself involved in the battles and Rome gained its ascendancy. 
So I go back to my point that what chapter 11 is doing, it is, it is amplifying, it is magnifying the, the battles that would have facilitated the transition from one nation to the next. And so I, I am happy for that because we are, we are lulled and tempted to believe that these nations just quietly move from Greece to Rome and then from Medo-Persia to Greece. But the fact is these victories were won with intense battles and loss of life. And so verses 11, verses 15 to 28 talks effectively about Imperial Rome. And I gave you some pointers you could look at, but I want to suggest that if you go back and read those verses, it may look um, uncomfortable to understand. But if you spend some time on it, you'd realize what it is afterwards. So I want to I wanna basically um, take a stop here, and then we will come back next week to discuss religious and civil room from verses 29 to 39. And then we'll talk about the end of time in verses 40 to 45. All right? After that, we will be basically hit our conclusion. So, so I want us to kind of take a stop here. I'm open for any questions. If we need to go back into anything, we will. Um, but I just wanted to make sure it's, it's 407. And I don't want us to um, overstep our crease. All right, because we have a lot to cover, but I want to make sure that we can cover it in a way that is really um, guiding us. So we've covered a lot of historical stuff. We got to, um, we got to the point now where um, we are at the overview and the third vision explained. We've discussed the Persia, Greece, um, Imperial Rome, etc. And what we will discuss next week will be religious Rome and the one about the end of time. All right, so the question that came here, it says, in Daniel 10, which is the previous chapter, 20 to 21, it mentions, mention is made of angel Gabriel is returned to fight with the Prince of Persia and the prince of Greece. Who is the prince of Persia? Is that Alexander? So, so the answer is no. The answer is that the prince of Persia is, a, um, is an angel, an, a very strong angel who is on the side of the devil and who has been assigned to Persia, meaning that his assignment is to basically stop Persia from... Um, I'll, it's, to, it's to facilitate Persia in stopping the Jews from continuing to build the temple for God. So the prince of Persia is an angel. It couldn't be Alexander because I would, we would all doubt that a human being, who Alexander was, would take 21 days to fight ancient Gabriel. Gabriel will destroy Alexander in a one. When, when Jacob was <coughs> wrestling with an angel, um, as he was approaching Esau and feeling very guilty, etc. Um, the angel just simply touched him in his thigh and he came to an end. So for Gabriel to be fighting 21 days, Manus, Manus, as they say, and not being able to um, conquer it, the prince of Persia was an angel. All right, so he's an angel, but an evil angel assigned to the army of the devil. So the devil is, he is, remember the devil is always attempting to mimic God. So God has a chief angel called Gabriel. Um, the devil had a chief angel for Persia called the Prince of Persia, who is assigned to fight the issues around Persia. So Gabriel comes and he fights with this angel and for 21 days they have a stalemate and they can't seem to succeed. But Jesus, who is Michael, who is, who is like God? That is the rhetorical question that Michael means. Jesus comes and he brings an end to the battle and he overcomes the prince of Persia. And it is to his credit because in doing that, 
Cyrus the king is no longer um, negatively influenced to stop the building of Jerusalem. And he allows it to continue, all right? So the prince of Persia, and I, I can say it very clearly, is an evil angel who has been assigned by the devil Lucifer to look after the things in Persia and try to influence the day-to-day -day activities. He is being fought off by God's angel, which is Gabriel, who is fighting the more for this day. Right, so the another question comes and says, um, right, let me just deal with this other question. The angel told Daniel, the prince of Greece is to come. So who is the prince of Greece? All right, so, or oh, the prince of Greece. Well, the, the prince of Greece, so you're really afraid to the prince of Greece as opposed to the prince of Persia. So the prince of Greece is indeed Alexander. All right, and, and that one we can answer that that is the Prince of Greece as opposed to the Prince of Persia. The Prince of Persia would have been the fight. Alexander would have been the one we talk about as the Prince of Greece, who was the prince who would come as a powerful prince for a while and then he would be destroyed. All right, the other question comes from um, Daniel chapter 11, 21. It makes reference to a vile person who peaceably obtained the kingdom by fratling. Is this religious room? And the answer is yes. So, so that is the reference it is making. And we have to kind of, once we keep the scene and the sequence alive in our heads, then these things become clearer. So the, the fact is that we know Rome subtly moved from imperial Rome to religious political Rome. And that religious political Rome, it was described even in Daniel chapter 9 and later on in Daniel chapter 8 as a king who is able to win through flattery and through words, that kind of thing, right? So yes, the, the reference here is the religious room, which we'll discuss a little bit when we get to next week's section. So let me just go back and um, say to the person who asked the question around the prince of Greece, my apologies. I thought you were talking about the prince of Persia. Uh, yes, the Prince of Grisha is indeed Alexander. And that is who we are making reference to. All right? Yeah, yeah no problem. So, so they, they, they are acknowledging that they were indeed referencing um, the Prince of Persia, and that is the Prince of Grisha, sorry. And that is now clarified for us going forward. All right, so, so I, I, I want to suggest to you that it's going to take a lot of rereading and reading, and I suggest you have a lot of your support literature with you when you do Daniel chapter 11. Just make sure that whatever readings you follow are consistent with the visions given before and that they are not taking us in a trend that is completely different to what we are accustomed to. All right? If you have that, then you're in a better place going forward. All right, so I want to, I want to take a, a stop now at this point in time. And when we come back next week, we'll talk about religious political room, which one of the questions made reference to just now, that they came through flattery and through ease um, rather than through fighting. Um, because religious room just emerged, if you will, without having to throw a weapon and overcome anybody as a powerful nation. And then um, we talk about Daniel 11, 40 to 45, which is a tremendous bit of... of, um, of um, scriptural verse that we need to appreciate and understand. Any other questions? Any comments? Anybody? I think we've covered a lot today. I really appreciate the fact that you all were on. And um, what we can do is um, offer a word of prayer. And then we will um, sign off. And we turn again next week. All right? Yeah. So let's, let's have a, a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blessing. We thank you for all that you have done for us and for revealing so much of your word to us in the book of Daniel. Clearly, Lord, you are concerned about our safety. You are concerned about our, our, our mind and our peace of mind and ensuring that we understand that you are still in control, that you have a plan for this world. You are revealing that plan more and more every day. We are seeing that the succession of kingdoms that occurred in this world 
were not by chance, but they were under your supervision. And we know, Lord, that the world will end under your supervision. May we therefore make a decision now, don't care how much we understand or not understand, to serve you in spirit and in truth, to accept it by faith that you have died for us and that we can live with you. And because you have forgiven us of our sins, you will lead us into everlasting life. Bless us and guide us according to your divine will is our prayer in Jesus' most holy name. Amen. Have a good week, everyone. I hope we, um, I have whet your appetite and you'll be ready for next week when we cover um, some key sections going forward and we culminate in Daniel 11, 40 to 45. Have a good week and God bless.